Does everybody hear it? Yeah. Sure. Very good. Okay, well, thanks for being here. It's great to have a town hall in Omaha. As you know, I'm Glenn Grothman. I'm your congressman. Um, seems hard to believe, but this is the beginning of my the fourth year that I've been in Congress. Um, the way the job works is, I uh, in a normal month, I spend three weeks in Washington and one week back. This happens to be the week back. And uh, so we, we do some town halls. I spend some of the time doing factory tours, that sort of thing, but some of the time doing town halls. We did four yesterday. We'll do four today. I'll start off, to, uh, by the way, did they, uh, have you all submitted questions? Yep, we have them all in the bucket. Okay. What I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about what's going on in, uh, too long? in Washington. And I'll give you my maybe inside story of some of the uh, news that's been in the paper, and then we'll open up and try to go through your questions. Uh, as far as what's going on, I think the thing that dominated the news in the last week and was the reason why I was in Washington on Monday when I didn't intend to be was the government shutdown. Uh, the government, to give you a little bit of background on how the government shutdown happened. On the federal level, our budget is on a fiscal year beginning October 1st. For a variety of reasons, and this is not unusual, they never seem to get the budget done by an October 1st. So what happens is we do continuing resolutions there and there afterwards while people negotiate. And they were nowhere near getting the budget this time. I actually don't even, as I understand, they're not even negotiating yet, which is a little bit ridiculous. But in any event, we passed what they call continuing resolutions, keeping spending the same amount we did the prior year. And uh, I always think that should be relatively uncontroversial. And I voted for them to keep the government open. I voted for a couple of them to keep the government open under Barack Obama. I voted for a couple of them to keep the government open under Donald Trump. Uh, this time, however, um, on any appropriation bill, it requires 60 votes in, in the Senate to pass it. Okay, and we we passed uh, the continuing resolutions out of this out of the House. When it got to the Senate, almost all Republicans voted for it. Not every Democrat voted against it, but the vast majority of Democrats voted against uh, a continuing resolution because they felt we had to do something now about the DACA program. The DACA program is involved with people who came here as parents, brought them here illegally as children. Uh, now they're in the country. Some people feel they ought to have a legal status or even a pathway to citizenship. And the Democrats felt so strongly about that they were willing to shut down the government trying to, I guess, blackmail or push President Trump or push the Republicans into giving some sort of citizenship or some sort of legal status. President Trump has said he wants to do something with the DACA. To me, however, though, it's not something we have to do right away because a lot of these people have been in the country for 25 years and it hasn't been a problem for the last 25 years. So why, you know, if we wound up passing something in March or April, why that's too late, I don't know. But in any, in any event, the Democrats felt it was uh, something that had to be done right away. We did wind up shutting down the government for a couple of days. I like the way President Trump handled it. He kept the national parks open, the national monuments open. I think he, it, it bothered me when uh, President Obama shut down that stuff a few years ago. He really didn't have to shut it down. And I think President Trump realized that you know, people have their vacations planned, and it'd be really heartbreaking for them if they show up in Washington and you know, can't get to some of the monuments or some of the national parks. Uh, in any event, after a three-day shutdown, uh, the government did open back up. Like I said, I voted to keep it going in the first place, voted to keep it going in the second place. Uh, there was a little bit of an amendment saying that this continuing resolution will only last till February 8th. I, like I said, I'm, I'm glad not all the Democrats voted for the shutdown. I don't know what their mindset's going to be on February 8th. I would personally be surprised if we have a final deal by February 8th because right now the House that I'm a part of, while well, we had a working group um, put together a proposed deal on DACA, a proposed position, even that position is not yet the House position. When I go back next week, I'm led to believe there are going to be two or three meetings in which other Republicans are going to weigh in on things that they want to have done. Um, so, uh, and then we have to find a, get, a way to get 218 votes in the House, and then we have to negotiate with the Senate, and I don't see any way that all that's going to get done by, by February. Sometimes they surprise us. Sometimes the leadership will say this is a wonderful deal and they'll get 218 votes. But quite frankly, I would be surprised if that gets done. The, the big problem is this. If we don't solve the overall immigration problem, we would start the DACA problem again right away. 
okay? We have had a situation of presidents of both parties, and those of you who followed my career, I'm not a big fan of George Bush, but both parties really didn't do what they could to enforce the immigration laws. I think, I think the reason they didn't is there's a feeling that we need more people to work in this country, but rather than uh, pick the people who are supposed to work, they kind of let a lot of people sneak across the border, which I think is the wrong way to, to find out, you know, or to determine what the new generations of Americas, Americans are going to be. But I think under both uh, both Bushes, I think under Clinton, and I think Obama, under Obama, that's the way it worked. Now we're stuck with the children here, and we have to make sure that once we do something or allow some of these DACA people to be here legally, that in the future we are picking our immigrants. It's not determined by who sneaks across the border, and that's not determined by chain migration where people come here who might not be contributing citizens. So we'll see what happens. But like I said, I personally would be surprised, maybe I would be surprised if we wrap it up by February 8th. Since we last had a round of uh, town hall meetings, we did the tax cuts. And I voted for the tax cut. I think it was a good thing. I want to talk about it a little bit. Really, when we did the tax cut, there were four versions of the tax cut. First of all, there was a Republican plan called A Better Way, which we were supposed to run on. I don't think I ran on it. Um, it was rolled out over a year ago. I didn't like the original Republican plan because I think it was aimed too much at, uh, at what I'll call the investor class. For example, if you were getting interest income, you'd pay taxes at half the rate of if you were working for a living. That to me didn't make any sense. Uh, I thought, you know, the working man should be treated the same as someone who inherited a lot of money or whatever. And we changed that when the House Republicans voted on their plan, which was the second version of the plan. I voted on that to kind of keep the process moving forward, but I worked to get still more changes in there. Then the Senate came up with the plan, and finally the House and Senate got together for a final plan. Um, by the time they were done, one of the highlights was they lowered the top corporate rate from 35% to 21%. Even Barack Obama was in favor of doing something along those lines. Uh, oh, by the way, I see we have a celebrity in the crowd, Greg Underheim, former, former assemblyman for this area. Um, uh, so in any event, we had to be competitive with other, other nations around the world, and we lowered the top corporate rate from 35% to 21%. We also, however, uh, played with the personal income tax rates. It is hard for me to imagine a situation in which anybody making under $100,000 a year, and $100,000 is a lot of money, uh, anybody making under $100,000 a year is not going to make get an income tax cut. One of the things that I specifically fought for is I fought to keep the medical deduction on your tax return. A lot of people wanted to get rid of it because they also want to simplify the tax return. And they said, this is a line we can take off the tax return. I used to do taxes. And while most people do not get the medical deduction because to get it, you, it, it has to exceed 10% of your income, people who get the medical deduction are people who really are having a tough go of it. You might have people in a nursing home. You might have people who don't have any health insurance at all. You might have people who have uh, a very large um, health insurance premium. And I thought to remove that, you were just picking on people in the toughest of circumstances. And even though only 1% or 2% of the population may use it, it's people who use it who really need it. So I was glad we got that back in there. Um, otherwise, I think the only people who at least I hear complaints about are going to get a tax increase or claim they're going to get a tax increase because we did look out for people who own small business is people who are making a lot of money who do not own their own business. And I've had some complaints from that sort of person I'm not that upset because if somebody's making like a million dollars a year working for a company, you know, I think they have enough money. But the reason they may not get a, as much of a benefit as other people is we capped the deduction for state and local taxes at $10,000. Obviously, if somebody's making a huge amount of money, uh, they're paying more than that in state income tax. We capped the amount um, of the deduction for mortgage interest at houses um, at $750,000. Very few people have a house worth $750,000, but uh, that would be another group of people who are going to lose the deduction they used to have. If you will look, 
the only Republicans who voted against the tax plan were uh, Republicans who represented either New Jersey, New York, or California. That is because they have particularly high income tax rates there, and the Republicans in those districts heard from all their friends who do have over $750,000 houses and are paying a lot of income taxes, and that's why Republicans from those areas were not able, or did not, decided not to vote for the plan. Um, but that's a little bit as far as what's going on in the income tax cut. The next big thing that's going to happen when we get back, other than continue to continue dealing with the DACA, is we're going to begin to put together a framework for next year's budget, and I am on the budget committee. I mentioned a second ago that one of the reasons that it's kind of hard to get things going through there is for almost every bill, it, ta every bill, it takes 60 votes to get things through in the Senate. Um, and uh, there was once a year where you were able to get something through the Senate with only 51 votes. In the two-year period in this cycle, and we, we call it a cycle because we run for election every two years, um, in this cycle we actually I anticipated three chances to do that. Uh, for technical reasons, we had one shot at doing something with 51 votes in the Senate um, left over from 2016. And our first vote with 51 votes was supposed to be to get rid of Obamacare. And twice I voted for plans to get rid of Obamacare, but that didn't work out. Nevertheless, that was kind of the 2016 opportunity for the Senate to get something done with 51 votes. By the way, under the rules of the Senate, which virtually every senator is in favor of, that rule is not going to change any time in the near future. I do not think, though, I would, wouldn't mind if it changes, and President Trump wouldn't mind if it changes. Um, the next one, the 2017 vote, was the tax cut, right? And you remember the tax cut passed with, I think, 51 votes in the Senate. Now, we would look forward to the one opportunity to do something significant with 51 votes in 2018. I had hoped that was some sort of welfare reform. And uh, that's what I ran on. It's not a matter of being mean-spirited. I think right now the welfare system kind of <coughs> has a moral erosion on the American public. First of all, you're discouraging people from working, which is a big problem. Secondly, you're discouraging people from getting married, and it's very easy to come up with hypotheticals in which a, uh, you know, uh, a single person, um, if they get married, they could lose $30,000 in benefits. And I have enough anecdotal evidence that people are thinking that way, that uh, I think it's one of the things that's kind of causing the breakdown of the family. So it's something that I would have taken up even before tax reform because I think the moral problem caused by the, the welfare is a greater problem than the fact the economy is not growing as quick as we want. Nevertheless, uh, they pushed it off. I think President Trump and Paul Ryan, who's the Speaker of the House, had wanted to take it up this year. Um, there are rumors that the Senate does not want to do that. As a matter of fact, there are the rumors that the Senate does not want to take advantage of their opportunity to do something with 51 votes in 2018. If that is so, to me that is legislative malpractice. <coughs> um, everywhere else, you know, a majority on, a, say, the village board in Amro or the Amro school district or the state legislature, a majority can do whatever they want. <coughs> you have more water. Um, but in the Senate, they don't. Given how hard it is to become a U.S. Senator and how hard you have to work to get there, uh, it just amazes me that the Senators would not take advantage of doing something with 51 votes in 2018, but that is the rumor. If that is true, I think there is going to have to be a big fight and we are going to have to embarrass the Senate into action. Uh, you know, I'm obviously talking about it in these town halls. I've talked about it a little bit on radio. I serve on the Budget Committee, which is supposed to pass the resolution saying which topics we can pass with 51 votes. And uh, we're just going to have to try to educate the public and kind of have a, a fight here over the next two or three months as to whether we are going to be able to do something in the Senate or not. Because like I said, you work so hard for being a senator. Wouldn't you want to get stuff done? It just, it just yeah. fascinates me that when you got one shot a year, one shot a year. And you know, when I was back in the state legislature, they passed tons of stuff with a bare majority. You got one shot in the U.S. Senate, they might not take advantage of it. Just horrible. I don't think that has been t that uh, story has been picked up enough, and uh, but we'll see. 
when I get back next week, we're having a joint retreat with the senators. I'll certainly be weighing in with the, with the senators then. I've already talked to a couple of them last week. One of the, another problem we have, I think that causes Congress not to work as well as it should, is really the, the uh, members of the House and the members of the Senate don't meet that much. Um, I was in the state legislature. If you've ever been to the state capitol, you know, you see the assemblymen and the senators. They might go out to dinner together. They wander back and forth in the, on, in the rotunda. But um, in Washington, the senators are on the north side of the building. Their offices are further north. The, uh, the House meets on the south side of the building. Our offices are further south. I can spend all week in Washington and not see a senator, which is just not right. But once a year, at least the Republicans get together and have a joint meeting. We're going to have that joint meeting next week. And I intend to weigh in very strongly. And I think the other congressmen will weigh in very strongly as well in trying to deal with welfare reform. Um, so uh, that's kind of what's going on in the Budget Committee. The other thing going on in the Budget Committee is we are going to begin to set the parameters for the amount of money we're spending next year. It's kind of odd because we have not yet decided how much we're spending this year. I believe that when they wrap up um, what will be considered an omnibus bill, which is where we spend money, they're going to be spending way too much money. And I want to explain why you're going to be very disappointed in the amount you're spending. Donald Trump felt, and I agree with him, if you talk to people in the military, if you've got any kids or grandkids in the military, our military right now has a problem. You know, they have planes that can't fly because of lack of spare parts. They have tanks in Europe that apparently don't work because of the lack of spare parts. So I'm willing to believe they need more money. What happened is, for about six years, they went through uh, an uh, era of sequestration in which the amount of money we were spending on the military dropped. And they feel we need more money right now. There were certain Republicans, and I'm not really a, one of them, who felt that 5.5% was nowhere near enough and that we should be getting like a 9% increase in defense spending. Um, those people, however, won the day. And I believe the official Republican position in negotiations is to look for something like an 8.5% increase <coughs> in spending on defense. Traditionally, um, when we wind up passing the appropriations bill, because of the 60 rule, it's something both the Democrats and Republicans are going to have to agree on. The Democrats will allow an 8.5% 8% increase in defense spending, but only if they also get an 8 or 8.5% increase in non-defense spending. And uh, you wind up setting the stage for a very big spending budget indeed. That is a big problem. I will fight uh, and increase that grade in the budget committee. But negotiations will go on, and I do not see one of my one of the most disappointing things in Washington right now is given how in debt we are. I don't see a sense of urgency on the spending side, which is just really tragic. Um, right now, we have a situation in which every man, woman, and child in the country is about six is about sixty thousand dollars as your share of the national debt, and it's not because you know we're not being taxed enough. The problem is. That we're overspending, and uh, I hope that uh, I hope our negotiators uh, draw a line on the sand here and say we just can't, you know, have a budget increase of seven, seven and a half percent. But I'm very afraid what is going to be negotiated for last year, and I'm very afraid what's going to happen next year. Uh, so that's kind of what's going on in the budget committee. I'm on the education and workforce committee. The major focus there is on higher education. We have, I was on the committee uh, last term as well. We have a new committee chairman there, a woman by the name of Virginia Fox, who is from North Carolina. She used to have a, an important administrative position at Appalachian State College in North Carolina. So not surprising, she's focusing primarily on higher education. I think there are two goals in that bill, and we voted for a bill out of committee. Um, one of those goals is to make sure that kids in the future have less student loan debt. And to me, that's a complete scandal. I mean, you run into people, you run into couples, you know, maybe they're 30 years old, they have $100,000 in student loan debt between them. That's just ridiculous. One of the things we're going to do is we are going to sanction um, universities or educational institutions if too high a percentage of the students who go there 
wind up not paying back their student loans. And we're going, by doing it, we're going to try to push the universities into steering kids into degrees in which they can't get jobs. Hopefully, uh, sometimes I think universities are accepting kids you could pretty much predict are not going to be able to make their way through anyway. And then, of course, they're in a lot of trouble. And even once you get the right degree, it would be good if the universities would try to push kids into internships, which will also make it more likely that they'll be able to get jobs. The other purpose of that is for the good of the economy, we have to get more kids in what I call skills-based education. Okay, we had a uh, job fair we did in Fond du Lac a couple months ago in our office. The trades, for example, pipe, the pipe trades, that sort of thing, they have a shortage of people working there. And if you were a skilled tradesman, you could make a lot more money than a lot of the people coming out of college right now. We want to push more people in that area. We also need more skilled people in our factories. Uh, this area that I work in, to digress for a second, something I didn't know until I got this job. <coughs> You know, Wisconsin, we have the second highest percentage of our workforce in manufacturing. The only state that's higher is Indiana. It's really close. Indiana's one. We're number two right behind them. And there's a, a drop before you get to Michigan. And this district that I happen to represent, there are more manufacturing jobs here than anywhere else in the country. Do you know that? If I have you know, the 435 congressmen, you'd say, what, what district has the most manufacturing jobs? You'd probably figure it's you know, Houston or Detroit or Pittsburgh or something. It's right around here with Oshkosh and Fond du Lac and Sheboygan, Ripon, places like that. But in any event there, uh, again, they can't find people. Whether you're talking about the trades or manufacturing, again and again, the top people they have are sometimes older, 50, 60. They're not going to be there 10 or 15 years from now. So we've got to make sure that uh, we have more people in the pipeline to do the most important things we do. Uh, so that's kind of the goal of the higher education bill. Um, the other committees I'm on, I mentioned the budget committee, I'm on the government oversight committee which deals with government scandals. Things went a little slower on that committee than I wanted. The original chairman, for those of you who watched C-SPAN, was a guy by the name of Jason Chaffetz who was very active and made it about the busiest committee in Congress. Uh, he retired to make more money. And the new guy on there, Trey Gowdy, took him a while to decide what he's going to do when things haven't been going quite as fast. But I think things will pick up in the near future. So that's a little bit about what's going on. What else can I tell you? Um, Donald Trump. Haven't had a chance to talk to him a great deal since he was elected. I do believe he tweets too much. Um, I, think it's, <laughs> I think it's unprofessional. I did have one about two-minute conversation with him. And you know, I've watched people around him, usually they just fawn all over him, but I use my two minutes to try to persuade him to stop tweeting too much. I fail, <laughs> don't admit to failure, but I, I didn't succeed there. Uh, eventually, presumably, I got another two minutes somewhere down the road and I'll try again and I'm collecting anecdotes to tell him how it, and, and it, you know, I think it hurts our, it hurts in a variety of ways, but by making him less popular, it makes him, um, it makes it more difficult for him to get things through Congress. You know, you look on this tax cut and people were kind of rebelling on it and he had to hold their hand. And um, if he were more popular, he could drive things through more. And so he hurts himself, he hurts us, because I think in general he's doing a good job. But um, like I said, a lot of people will, will judge him by his tweets. He thinks it makes him more popular. and. I don't know what you can do to change his mind, but I, I collect anecdotes to, to tell him about how he hurts himself if I ever get another two minutes to talk to him. So there's a little bit about what's going on. We'll open it up for questions. Here, I think they have, do we have a list of... <laughs> Normally, I think the bucket is upstairs. I think I hear them. <laughs> Let's see. Rachel's oh, here we are. There is the bucket. All right. Our first one is Joanne Crescent. Okay. Joanne? I was asking about DACA. I'm really not in favor <coughs> of DACA. I'm sorry, you didn't hear you. I'm not in favor of DACA. Right. I, um, I think that if they wanted to go back or become a, a legal citizen, they could have somehow. I mean, um, I'll, I'll tell you, I think Donald Trump expects something to be done, and I think the votes are there that something's going to be done. 
immigration reform is something that we have to do. We've got to get rid of the diversity, um, the diversity stuff there. We have to get rid of the chain migration. Exactly. And to get rid of any of that stuff is going to require 60 votes in the Senate. Uh, I mentioned that once a year we're able to do some things with 51 votes in the Senate, but that's limited to things associated with mandatory spending. It's limited to um, debt or limited to taxes. Uh, and one of the things we've got to do is do something on immigration. Building the law will be a good thing. Um, and like I said, making sure that in the future all immigrants are good immigrants. One thing that scares me about the DACA that they're talking about, they're talking about making 690,000 people legal. I'm very afraid that if they do that, eventually some judges are going to come in there and make that number a lot bigger. And um, so we've got to make sure when it's done, it's restricted uh, on the amount of people that are allowed to be legal. Um, I would like to see um, some individual vetting of people on a case-by-case -case basis. Obviously, we don't want to let people in who have criminal records. Um, I don't want to let people in who have any sort of take advantage of any sort of welfare. And people exactly. shouldn't be able to do that if they're here illegally anyway. But anecdotal evidence, I mean, I've heard of people who work in social services offices and they feel that people are coming in here and taking advantage of the welfare. So we just have to make sure that if something is going to happen, um, we get only the best people are here and we have to make sure that from this point on, only the best citizens come here. I agree. I agree with Donald. Right, right, right. Right. And, but Donald Trump himself has said he wants something to happen. Now, maybe nothing will happen, and maybe we'll begin to remove people. I don't know. Um, but if it's going to happen, we want to make sure it's the best deal we can get. Can't they go back and get in line and do it legally? Like uh, tell us about the line. Uh, Why can't they go back and do it legally? I think that would be the right thing to do. Yeah. Is there a line? I, I am telling you, in reality, if you're in Washington, among Republicans, I bet a surprising high number would vote for um, just outright legality right now. I mean, if there was a straight up and down vote, so that that's that's where we are in our negotiating. And what's going to happen if all of these become legal is the Democrats are going to get more votes. Yep. Well, I think that is a motive for um, one of the reasons why the Democrat Party is trying to hold out here and, and threaten to shut down the government. And uh, it's a fight for people like me to say that, well, we don't want a government shutdown. There are worse things than a government shutdown, and one of those things would just be floods of new people here. Um, but. You would be surprised the number of Democrats who did vote for a shutdown. Like I said, it wasn't all of them, um, but the vast majority did. And you would be surprised the number of Republicans who don't think exactly the way the Democrats, but close to the Democrats. So um, it's going to be a fight, and uh, I'll, I'll do all I can to hold out for as tough a position as we can get. Uh, but like I said, I don't know if we have 218 votes for a tough position in the House, and then you've got the Senate, which is worse than the House. And you've been reading the paper about people like Lindsey Graham and you know that crowd, which is a problem. Um, I think what we've got to do is we've got to publicize the problems, and then we have to publicize the fact that a lot of these DACA people are not people we want here, right? And I talk about that. You saw people protesting, say, Nancy Pelosi. And are those people going to make good citizens if they're here? Obviously not. And uh, so that's kind of the situation that's out there with regard to DAC right now. It's a very important position. It's a very important debate because it's the future of our country. I mean, our birth rate isn't that high. I think our economy is very strong. Um, we're going to have more immigrants come here. And we want immigrants who are responsible immigrants. Right. And to a certain extent, you're right. If we get immigrants who are not responsible immigrants, they're going to vote for irresponsible politicians. Mm -hmm. And they're which going is, to want more money. Right, right, right. And uh, that's why it's such an important debate and why it's something the Republicans have to always hold their line on. 
And I'll tell you, I sat in the rooms where we had the government shutdown. And there were Republicans in those rooms who are very worried about a shutdown. And you don't want a shutdown. It's more of a problem than some people think. But it's, we'd rather shut down the government than go down the path of ruining America. And I think doing what some of those Democrats wanted, immediately legality for all these people, and then just starting the, the open borders thing again would ruin America. I mean, it would be the end of America. Right? Okay, next. Craig Bartlett. Craig Bartlett. Craig Bartlett? Yes. So, the format for this town hall is that we're going to draw the questions at random. And once your question is drawn, then you can ask your question and the congressman will respond. So just make sure that we don't talk over anyone, we don't clap, so that everyone can hear the questions and hear the responses. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, I've got a number of questions, but I'll just only ask one. Okay. Well, what do you think of all the liquid manures? For I farm, and I do put apple clay liquid manure, not at the rates that they do. And like where you live on that whole east side of the state now, the regulations are the, are the, the topsoil. You know, there's like some, there's no topsoil, and they're spreading the liquid manure. And with the water quality, what do you think of that? I think the amount, uh, I think the amount you're allowed to spread is determined by the DNR, correct? Correct, but the, you know, the, the, they're not regulating it enough, might I, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, it's not a federal issue, and so as a result, I haven't. So water quality is not a federal issue either. I thought it was I a federal a, issue. Well, no, I think I think right, people want to protect the water quality. Yeah, I think the it. amount of of uh, fertilizer you can put on is something that the DNR is in charge of, and presumably when the DNR. But don't puts the feds have some regulation in that too, though? Don't uh, the have regulations on water? We'll look at it. Yeah. Um, and I'll talk to you afterwards to see, you know. Right. You know, I'm just, you know, it's, <laughs> right. it's a concern because you can see the phosphorus right. levels. I, I know um, when I was in the state legislature, that was a frequent subject of debate. I know the DNR has regulations. I am not sure the degree to which those regulations are, are driven by the federal government. I'm in the impression that they have a lot of flexibility and when they have you know, when they have these big farms and when they have to determine how much fertilizer you're able to put on, I think most of that flexibility rests with the DNR. Right. William Carpenter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was concerned with this Mueller troll. And how come it just goes on and on mm -hmm. and yes, really it's really nothing there? And now at the same time, we have this thing called the society, you know, another investigation on the Democrats where all this has happened over eight years, and they just let it all drift away. Nothing's happened to any of these people. Um, I, I think soon, where there's going to be a memo released uh, with regard to how the FBI behaved in uh, during the election, I am pushing for that memo to be released. Um, I read the memo, but because we had to sign some document before we read it, I can't talk about exactly what's in it. I'm pushing it for it to be released because I think if it's released, I think it will get more in the public eye uh, as far as the FBI wasn't maybe exactly uh, impartial in the last election. <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully it will wake up the American public a little bit to what's going on. Uh, I agree with you right now, the bureaucracy clearly did not want, um, of course becoming more and more apparent, did not want Donald Trump elected. And I think insofar as we get things out there, uh, first of all, it's just right to get it out there because we want everybody to know what's going on. Uh, but hopefully it will appall the American public a little bit. What do you think of the secret society you know, they're talking about? Well, well that seems to be something that I, I will say this in general. I know a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump, obviously, and I know a lot of people who voted for Hillary Clinton. I think people in the U.S. government, if they live in the Washington, D.C. area, they might not know anybody who voted for Donald Trump, which is hard to believe. Um, I mean, how, how could you have such a... But the attitude of people there towards the idea that he might win the election was first of all, it's something they never believed in a million years. Uh, but it's a real problem. Uh, because I think your government, a lot of your government people want him to fail. And 
and uh, we have to educate the public as far as what's going on. Um, and I think if we tweet a little less, like I said, he'd be more popular, which would be helpful in, you know, in standing up to that Washington bureaucracy. I am on the Government Oversight Committee. I wish they were more aggressive as far as exposing some of this stuff. Uh, and something that bothers me, my new committee chair is having to be prodded along those lines. And we've had some closed door meetings to try to prod them a little bit further to look into this stuff a little bit more. Um, but it's a very scary thing because we, we have a situation where the government's supposed to be impartial. And I think a lot of those government people are not at all impartial. They want Donald Trump to fail. And that's, that should not be what's going on at all. Roger Atley? Yeah, I had a. I work in the dairy industry, <coughs> yep. and I do consulting and farm management and nutrition on dairy farms. And I would guess 90, 80, 90 percent of the milking cows in our district are milked by Latinos. Now, the 80 or 90 percent of those cows milked by Latinos, those Latinos are more than likely illegal. However, and I'm, I'm actually in favor of a border wall. But what I would like to see is like a door at the wall where you could give a person a work permit so that they're work permitted to work here illegally. At least we know who they are and where they are. Right. That is all that will have to happen. We do not have enough people to do the work. And the important thing is that everybody who works here uh, goes through the paperwork, we know has a job. Uh, and, and until this point, because of the necessity of more people to work in the country, they have solved the problem by letting people sneak across the border. I don't know what percentage of those people you could say are hardworking and what percentage you could say no, but the goal should be every immigrant is a good immigrant. It shouldn't be we'll let people sneak across the border and I don't know what the percentage should be. Well, we'll take uh, two good ones for every one bad one because that would ruin the country. And I think that has been the attitude, not only of Democrat administrations, but the attitude of the Obama, uh, of the Bush administrations too. Because we need new people to work here, we'll, we'll let people sneak across the border. Right. Lou Steeny? Yes. Mine is on Social Security, which I think everybody is really knows about. Uh, they had, over the Obama years, we had a number of years where there was no increase in COLA whatsoever. And at other times, we're at below 1%. Now they said, big deal, 218, 2018 is going to have 2% increase. Sounded great until we find out that the Medicare payment went up just as well, which wiped out the increase in the Social Security. Now they're talking about chain COLA, which is the, uh, it's going to make it even worse. And the only, they don't even take in food and, and energy in consideration for this looking at how much the increase should be. And that's what goes up the most, and that's what most people depend on. So I'm worried about Social Security is going to be getting less and less, whether well, you like it or not. Well, there are two problems. There's the Medicare problem and the Social Security problem. Uh, Social Security, if we don't do something, I think will run out, I guess, depending on who's doing the guessing, around uh, 2031, 2032. But before you came around, Congress was taking money out of the Social Security yes. constantly yes. to pay for other things. Otherwise, we wouldn't have the problem we've got now. Um, I think a lot of the problem, though, dates back to earlier in Social Security, where in the 60s, I believe, Congress allowed a lot of recipients to get a whole lot more out of the Social Security system than they put in. And they've been behind the eight ball ever since then, hopefully by improving the economy. We'll get more Social Security receipts, which will push things off for a while. Um, but right now, it is a huge problem. Um, we've got to make sure we don't use that money for anything else. Um, there was an effort made in the budget, or some people in the budget wanted to say Social Security should not be taxed at all, income tax-wise. And then some of the people on the committee found out something they didn't know before that and some of the taxes on Social Security go to keep Social Security solvent. Uh, so they couldn't do anything on that. Um, it is a problem. Donald Trump says he's not going to have any reductions in Social Security or Medicare on his watch, which is good, but in the long run on Medicare, we've got to do something so that people have a little bit more of a buy-in on the amount of money that's being spent there. And um, those the increases are so minimal, and then with the... Uh 
Medicare right, that, that's right. We, gotta, we, gotta, we, have to, we have to get a handle on the cost of Medicare so that, so that, the, so that the premiums don't go up. Right. Susan Schlechtenhofen? Stop right there. Okay. So I'm just concerned about the immigration policy, and I want to say that I am for DACA. I think it was a uh, um, really um, de tough decision by Trump to end it, and as put us in this predicament now. But um, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about DACA recipients. <coughs> uh, there is uh, misinformation about immigration to this country in general. For many, many years, our immigration policy has been based on family reunification, bringing families back together. And I, I myself have worked with refugee families and immigrants since going back to the 70s. They, immigrants bring enormous gifts and talent to this country. You can't always assess somebody at that point of entry what talents that they're going to bring or what they're going to contribute to your society. Well, um, so I just, I okay. just wish that you would uh, not spread more misinformation about DACA recipients that they, for example, are on welfare. They, they can't be on welfare to even be in the DACA program. So I think there's the people have to start to go a little deeper than the headlines and realize that you're giving up some of your values in this country if you well. simply close the door and say we only want physicists and highly educated people from Norway. Our immigration um, policy should not be based um, on racism. Well, 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 right now, we still run about 800,000 new people a year in this country, which is a lot of people. Inevitably, we're going to have to make judgments, right? I mean, if we said any of you who comes here wants to come here, you, you, you'd wind up with millions of, you know, you can wind up I think if you said we're not going to have immigration laws, you'd get tens of millions of people right away. And uh, so we are going to have to make a call. I think in that call we want to make sure we have people here who are going to fill jobs that we need. Amen. And, uh, and that by itself will be a significant number. As far as people coming here, illegal people getting uh, welfare payments, they shouldn't. All I can do is tell you, I mean, it should be against the law. But I can tell you, I've heard anecdotal evidence from people that that has happened. Well, um, I mean, I've talked to people who work in social services, and just giving you giving you my opinion. As you know, uh, there are people out there who want to have sanctuary cities or sanctuary states, in which you don't even ask people whether they're here legally or illegally. Toby Vandenhaven, Hi, sorry. Yeah. yeah, that's me. Uh, first of all, thanks for having the town hall. Please ask the senators to do the same. Um, I love living in democracy. Uh, democracy to me means opinions on both sides get discussed and talked about. I'm actually disgusted with the diverse, um, divisiveness in D.C. right now. All politicians across the board. So my question is, how do you as our representative get to know what the constituents of our, our district will be doing. Okay, first of all, I'll deal with the divisive issue. I think things are, are divisive in our country right now, but as I mentioned, almost everything we do in Washington is bipartisan. Yeah. Okay, and sometimes that can be very expensive, but as long as they have the 60 rule in the Senate, every significant, or all, until the tax cut, Every significant bill that was passed in Washington was bipartisan. They had a big, expensive reform on Medicare, bipartisan. They had the most significant education bill since No, no Child Left Behind, bipartisan. They had a significant transportation bill, bipartisan. Um, the three big omnibus bills, which were really the what, what normal people I think would call budget bills, were all out of necessity bipartisan. So every significant thing we do in Washington is bipartisan. And as far as not getting along, I think socially we get along very well. I mean, I don't know what they always show on C-SPAN, but I chit-chat with the Democrats on everything under the sun, including public policy. Uh, and so far as people don't get along, there are just fundamental differences between the two parties that a lot of times stick out when you decide to run and say, I'm going to be a Republican and be a Democrat. 
in general. Uh, the Republicans feel that you know there's too much paperwork there on business, and a lot of the Democrats feel that that's not true as far as government spending. Uh, like I said, I think you're going to see. I mean, it amazes me how much the Republicans want to spend, but even so, the Democrats in general want to spend more than the Republicans. But I think they maybe highlight a few angry people on the floor of the floor of the House. But in general, I think the parties get along very well. Uh, there's just a fundamental difference in which direction to go. And what's your second question? It was just generally how do you oh, how do I get to know people? Get to know well, what your constituents well, want. Um, we have several of, of these sort of meetings, but to be honest, I always feel in these meetings I might not be getting a cross section. And I come home every weekend, unlike some other congressmen. I try to get out and about the community, showing up at you know fundraisers for Lions clubs or churches or what have you. And I'm always asking people what's on their mind. Uh, last night I was at a meeting at the Beaver Dam Chamber of Commerce, and I talked to as many different people as I could. You know, what's on your mind? What do you think we're doing? That sort of thing. We also send out questionnaires. We have an email list you can sign up for. Uh, we have thousands of people on that list, and uh, we get input that way as well. And on that note, a lot of you put your email on this card, but you did not check the box that you want to receive our e-newsletter. If you want to receive it, you have to check the box. By um, law, we have to have you subscribe for it. Um, so if you would like to do that, come and see me afterwards. Harvey Fenske. I would like to know what's wrong with our Justice Department. Uh, we got people that watch it kind of like this uh, Clinton, uh, Mills, Hillary Clinton, they uh, violated the Constitution as much as they can. Now they just uncovered 40 uh, emails in this uh, Wiener laptop that are right. uh, all uh, I, I hope our, not secret, um, and uh, there's nothing done about it. Um, I hope our government oversight committee has been be more aggressive in the future, and that's all I'm going to say. I mean, I've waited with our chairman to have more hearings, and hopefully he will. Juanita Warmer? Warmer? No, it's me. <laughs> oh, I'm concerned about our educational system. Mm -hmm. uh, Common Core was uh, supposed to be done away with, and I know they say that it has been, but basically it just renamed. The system is still in progress. Um, our whole Public education system is just bankrupt. It's a kind of moral character, and, and uh, we're just heading down a socialist communist path in our whole education system, including local and the universities. Um, well, I'll say this. When, when I talk about what the major problems are in America, um, the fact that in the type of classes that determine how people think, uh, the overwhelming number of professors are, are left to center. The law schools, the, school, the schools of education, um, the uh, um, schools of journalism, and that's a huge problem. Right. And in my opinion, because we did get rid of Common Core, <laughs> a lot of the problem is just the initial the whole education establishment. And I, when I talk to school board members, I always encourage, they always run and they get they always look at the budget. And the budget's important, but as a practical matter in this state, we have state spending limits, and the amount of money almost every school district spends are gonna to spend to the maximum they can under the school spending limits, which are, I think, pretty well done anyway. So that's not my major concern. I wish more members of school boards were paying attention to the curriculum, because to me that is the more important of the problem. I think on a university level, um, if I was still in the state legislature and I would ever run to the state legislators, uh, I encourage them to try to do something to provide educational balance uh, in the university system. I have said I wish I could find some multi-multi-multi-billionaires to take out ads on television and educate people um, on another side of history or moral and moral issues in general that they're getting on our education system. And if I was the dictator, I'd find people to do that because there are plenty of wealthy people who donate money to other causes, and I wish they would donate money to causes and 
cause people to understand why our country is great and um, explain a little bit more about our history and explain a little bit more about how you should live your life. That would be my dream. Well, I know one of the reasons. One of the uh, campaign issues with Donald Trump is getting into the Department of Education. It's my not Correct. We're not making any progress. Uh, no, I have talked to uh, Betsy DeVos, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously we're not going to get rid of the Department of Health. Like, I am on the Education Committee, and even on that committee among Republicans, uh, it's very difficult for them to agree to spend even a little bit less money. So that's a problem. Um, I'll continue to meet with her and encourage her to advocate for reducing the role of, uh, of the Department of Education. And um, I'm not sure she got that job expecting to try to shrink that department. <laughs> but uh, I will. I'm supposed to meet with her sometime, I think, in the next three weeks. We were supposed to meet with her in December, and uh, that, that, um, that meeting was canceled, but I think sometime in the next three weeks I'll have a chance to talk to her again. Paul Bauer. Uh, thank you, Congressman Grothman. Uh, I just want to reinforce uh, the importance of getting to the bottom of our justice system and restoring trust in our, I, I, in my, you know, I, I see you're shaking your head here, but I'm a salesman. I travel from the Fox Valley to the northern suburbs of Green Bay every day. Every place I go, people say, what's going to happen to our government? So all these other scenarios that are happening are critical, but I just want to reinforce to you that this is what's on America's mind, and we, we can't wait anymore. And we have to win the public relation war on this because... You're 100% right. Well, because the, 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 the government is... When our justice system is weighing in for one party more than the other, it's really dangerous. I'm glad you were saying this because I'm glad we have so many people here concerned about that. Because right now, I think there's some people who are not being aggressive enough in Washington because in this case, they're afraid to appear partisan. That's just what it boils down to. But we're losing the public relation now because the other side is not afraid of, of, of saying their views. So I'm just, again, reinforcing the importance of someone to represent the American people, the, the people in Wisconsin that I just communicated to you that talk to me on it. It's, it's, at, it's at the brink. So, uh, um, I, I agree with you. We have to do it not only to make sure people who feel that way um, are elected in the future, but so people realize what would be at stake if the wrong people get in there again. And the only way you can uh, do that is make sure the public knows what is going on. And I don't think enough people know what's going on. They don't realize what would happen until it's too late. I agree with you. Craig Underhine. When um, Schumer was talking about the uh, um, the shutdown and the list of issues he wanted to address, I heard him say <laughs> twice. Both times, at the end of his comments, he said, "And pensions." Uh, is there conversation in Washington about having the federal government step in? and fix the state pensions in places like New Jersey and New York. Nobody talks about that. I have heard of nobody talk about um, getting involved in state pensions, and they should not, because as you know, in the state of Wisconsin, we have been very responsible, and our state pension plan is, I believe, the mo either the most funded or second most funded in the country, and uh, I have heard of nobody suggest that. There are some concerns. I wish you were talking about that. There is some concern about some private pensions that are going under. Uh, I don't know if that's what he meant, because it's an issue that eventually is going to have to be addressed. Um, and something called multi-employer plans. All sorts of businesses could go under, and all sorts of people right now are in a, a difficult situation, in which their pensions could run out, and I think there's a feeling among people that something is going to have to be done there. Uh, but I have not heard anybody talk about bailing out like Illinois or other states that aren't adequately funding their pensions. Katie Prockham? When 
We have a chance to contact you, Congressman Grothman, and I have taken, I'm one of the people that have taken the opportunity to call my state senators, um, Tammy Baldwin and Ron Johnson. When you get this information, you get the calls, you get the emails, does it make a difference to you what the people in our area? Yes, do? yes, absolutely. I mean, I talk to my staff all the time about the, the phone calls that are coming in, the emails that are coming in. You can contact me either in the Fond du Lac office or in the Washington office. Does it change the way you vote? I, I know you have a responsibility to represent your people, and I know you feel strong. I'm hearing that today. Does it make a difference to you? Yes. I, I, um, for one thing, we do want to do in general what people in the, in the district want us to do. Uh, secondly, you know, in this job, there's so many different issues that you're supposed to vote on, and it's particularly good if I run across people who have knowledge that I don't have on the issues, because you can't really necessarily trust the lobbyists for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they're just not competent. Um, but it is not unusual at all for, I think, legislators to listen to particularly people who have experience in an issue that the legislator does not have, and I would really quite frankly trust people in the district over a lobbyist or over a staffer, quite frankly. That would be a good thing. So, yeah. Well, by the way, just I'll ask you really quickly, can you give me one example of an issue you've contacted me on? Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, affordable health care. Uh, okay. Some of the major issues, yes, okay. I have contacted you. And I think I'm one of the people that you're seeing now that are reaching out, uh, trying to make a difference. Good. That we hadn't done before. Okay. So it's nice to hear that you're receptive. And I will say, I think this meeting, you know, we compare it if I held this meeting two years ago, I think there are more people today than there would have been there yes. two years ago. Bill Hack? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Hack? 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 If you've got to limit it, I would say any mark of the police should put them out. I made your goal, I've never had a misdemeanor or a felony. And I would guess 88 or 90 percent of the people in this room are the same. So if they got a jail, feel right. out, okay? The other thing is in the Baltimore riots, I talked to you about this before, and uh, we're going to check on it. And uh, I understand that they use NAPFA funds for that. And if you know, that's for natural disaster. If you try to bring something down, it's not a natural disaster. And please put in your newsletter what funds were used to replace that. Insurance doesn't cover riots either. And the other thing I got is Congress sex problem. <laughs> if that happened to me, I have to pay taxes on half a million dollars that you gave to my girlfriend. I'm pretty sure that didn't happen. So I'd like those people uh, exposed, and I really would like to see a list of bums. And where they go from there, I don't know. Um, I would like to know, you know, there are rumors out there, there were a total of, I think, four congressmen last year who either quit right away or announced they weren't going to run for election because of this sort of stuff. And there was another one that was last week. I didn't know him that well. He was a Republican from Pennsylvania. Uh, and hopefully he'll be headed out really quickly. Can't force him out, but I know Paul Ryan uh, stripped him of one of his committee assignments, so hopefully he's on the way out. There were rumors floating around Washington that there were going to be 10 to 20 people uh, exposed for whatever this year. And I'm kind of surprised there was only one more person that came out in January. Uh, but. I think the quicker we get them out, the better. Uh, when I look at some of the people who've been named so far, I don't. I think if you are immoral in one way, you're immoral in other ways too. And some of these people who are leaving, believe me, we're not missing a lot. And uh, if there are another ten or twenty people like this, like I said, the sooner they get out of there, the better. I'd like to see them exposed. Oh, right. I would too. I would too. I mean, like right now, we have. I'm trying to think. We have two guys from, I'm just saying I'm on the Republican side, two guys from Texas. We had one guy from Arizona who had to quit. 
We had one guy from Pennsylvania who had to quit. We had another guy from Pennsylvania whose name is out there and it was so recent I don't know yet whether he's going to not run for election or quit right away or what we're going to do with him. And the rumors are there are more people like that out there. Not people who have had money from this government fund, but people who have um, done things that should cause them to be removed. And the quicker that happens, the better. And like I said, in general, the ones who have been exposed so far, we're not losing a lot otherwise. I mean, I, I didn't know this guy from Pennsylvania very well. I'd only recognize him. I don't remember having any conversations with him. But one of my close friends of mine, he was on a committee with him, and he said, it's a good thing because I got out of there. So, right. Okay. And then follow up on that Baltimore thing. Because I really, that really upsets me that they're using We'll look into it. I'll look into it right away for you. We'll, we'll, we'll have my staff. My staff will make sure you have your name, and we'll get back to you. Betty Bowles. Well, I don't have anything new like some of the subjects already came up. But um, as far as the DACA thing is concerned, I have an article here from the Washington Times. <coughs> the ones they have on the list weren't properly vetted, and some of them aren't even literate. So I think they should be re-vetted if they're going to let anybody through. And regarding, you know, I don't think people are against immigration and taking people in. No, there's just a huge, it, it's so a you question can't of who we people get. people just floating in and they're still taking these kids, boarding them first on airplanes and dropping them. <coughs> no, so, no so. question. For 20 years in this country, I think more than any other single issue, that's what caused Donald Trump to be elected. Because they know a lot of the mainstream politicians just didn't care. Mm -hmm. and, and another thing that's not addressed ever is this birthright citizenship. I am co-sponsor of a bill to get rid of birthright citizenship. Yeah, I would. Even the island of Saipan, I, I read the women, people from China go there and have babies and then they're considered citizens. I mean, it's just... Um, I do not believe birthright citizenship is in the Constitution. <coughs> I had a personal conversation with Donald Trump. He is very able to articulate that position very well. Um, we talk about putting the end of birthright citizenship in the so-called DACA compromise. I have weighed in with that, and so far I've not had a great deal of success. Um, Steve King is the one who's the leader on that, and I'll continue to try to get that if we pass anything taken care of, because birthright citizenship is another invitation to trouble. And it was certainly not something that was intended in the amendment to the Constitution that people point to. Another thing with Social Security and so on and so forth and welfare reform, so many of these things tie in. I, yes. I understand that, that there's jobs that will say, well, people won't do. Well, that's fine if you have other opportunities and you choose not to do that one, but I don't see where you can, I'm not going to do that job and then go sit on the dole somewhere. No, no, exactly. And that's why I talked about my major goal in the next month is to make sure we take up welfare reform sometime in 2018. And it is ridiculous if the Senate does not. And, and uh, that ties in with Social Security. Well, then they'll pass a bill about, you know, child refund or whatever. But what they do is refund their portion of the payroll tax. Well, then that decreases money going into Social Security. It all kind of, a lot of those things. I, I will say this. Together. In a perfect world, um, a good welfare reform will also reduce the number of bad immigrants coming in the country. Ted Koraluski. That's me, but I have no question. You don't have a question? Okay. Terry Steele. Yeah, I hate to do immigration again, but different aspect of this, and this is the wall. Mm -hmm. What what evidence do you have? How can you convince us that somebody can't climb over, dig under? Well, I think. No, wait, wait. Okay, I'm sorry. Destroy a remote part of that wall. You give us a lot of anecdotal evidence, but what real evidence do you have that an expensive wall like this is going to work? Well, uh, we, I was in Israel. There's a wall in Israel. That wall works. I will grant you nothing is perfect, but you've got to try, right? I mean, there's there's every system under the sun. There are people who get around the system. There are all sorts of laws people get around the system. It doesn't mean you don't try. It doesn't mean we have no laws at all. Yes, a wall will not be perfect. It'll certainly be a lot better than we have right now. Yeah. Isn't it quite expensive 
to try when you're not sure. And if you talk about well, Israel and Palestine, it, it, it obviously, that's not it, working. It will right. obviously have uh, a much better effect than what we have now. Right. That, that, that should be self-evident. Wayne Wagner? I have no question. No question? Okay. Diane Malecki? Yes. Um, I, it was, my what question was, my question was on DACA and immigration, but I'm wondering with the well-meaning people who are bringing people into this country, shouldn't they be held responsible to support them both financially and legally until they become citizens? Because it's not, it shouldn't be forced on the rest of us, first of all, I don't think to do that. And the other thing is I just heard um, on television that our, some, whether it's special forces team, someone tried to get over the prototype of the wall that they built and failed. So it, it is working. Okay. That's all I have. Thanks. Good. <coughs> Should they be responsible oh. financially and legally? It, the degree to which people are assisting illegal immigrants, I have heard of nobody propose that. I suppose in a perfect world that's true. You're right, there are people here who believe they are engaging in a moral good by helping people come here illegally. That is unquestionably true. And I guess in a perfect world, yes, they should be on the hook for caring for them, but I don't think that's gonna happen. I think, um, we'll talk later about it, but. It puts me on the hook to care for them. Though. Yeah, I know, I know. Okay. They, they're, the degree to which there are powerful people in this country, not powerful people, who don't want to enforce the immigration laws is shocking, right? And there are, are elected officials. One of the things they talk about in this DACA bill is doing something with these sanctuary cities. I mean, it's very difficult to enforce your immigration laws when you have elected officials kind of actively saying you shouldn't obey the immigration laws, right? Isn't that kind of horrible? And you have kind of like the, almost the whole state of California, or much of it, that is their opinion. And it shows how close we are to losing our country because when I was growing up, I don't remember a lot of discussion about the immigration laws, but I think it was probably unanimously felt they should be obeyed, whatever they were. This idea that we don't need immigration laws in this country, they should be ignored, is kind of a new thing. And a substantial segment of the population or at least a substantial segment of the elected people feel that way, right? I mean, look at cities or <coughs> counties or whole states. That's a big problem. You know, what do you have if the whole state of California says, we don't think the immigration laws are gonna be enforced? I mean, it's the end of the country, right? Sue Hazy? You already called me. Yeah. Oh, we, sure, we already did that. No, we yeah. didn't. Oh, okay. No. Oh, I'm, oh, fine. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't have a question. Oh, you have one up here. Okay. Sue Carpenter. Oh, I just, um, I think my questions were answered. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Joel Schlachter-Poppen. Yes. I'm, I'm trying also, to get it right. I'm you're sorry. That's perfect. perfect. <laughs> uh, I'm also a, a DACA supporter, along with, I think, the plus percent of the citizenry of the United States. And all of the churches, at least Catholic and mainline Protestant, that's Lutheran, Methodist, uh, Presbyterian, all supporting DACA and wanting that to be restored now. And my question is, will you make some effort in this next day to sit down with somebody from the Catholic Conference of Bishops or Lutheran Immigration Refugee Service or HIAS, the Jewish Refugee and Resettlement Agency, or Church Well Service. These are the people that actually do immigration and actually do a refugee resettlement. So they are the ones that really know. Their anecdotes are much uh, more plentiful than yours, and they're facts. So will you, my question is, will you commit to do all you can to get to have a sit down with staff from one of these agencies in uh, Washington, D.C. area? Or well, one of I, your staff. I, I'd rather sit, sit down, down with somebody around here. here. But, but yeah, sure. We somebody need... out there where the, our national offices are there. Okay. You have them call my, my office in Washington, and we meet people all the time. Some people I agree with, some people I don't. 
to the best of my knowledge, they haven't called my office, but I don't hear everybody who calls my office, but if they get my, if they call my office, I'll try to meet with them. And if I they guarantee you, you will get a call uh, tomorrow from the Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. Okay. And we'll now tell them you promise to meet with them or, or staff. Thank you. Right. Good. You Dick just need Price. that information. Dick Price. Um, yes. Uh, as in your discussion so far, uh, is uh, Medicare going to come up this year? As far as uh, changing the way that is uh, meant? Uh, uh, there will be no fundamental change. You're just not going to get to it, can't get to it, there's too many other things? Or? Well, uh, what, I I'm, what I'm saying is, is that that uh, uh, Paul Ryan the, uh, has talked about changing the way that Medicare is... Uh, I, I would be shocked. We had a major Medicare bill pass the first year I was there. Donald Trump has said he wants no big change in Medicare. <laughs> Maybe he'll change his opinion. Somebody told me he might. But uh, the, to the best of my knowledge, he has said he's not he's not going to bring something up, and I do not anticipate, certainly not this year, I do not anticipate anything, at least in Donald Trump's first year, making any fun, first term, making any fundamental changes. Mary Fenske? Right here. I have two or three questions. One of them was on the repeal of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. What has, you know, they did pass something, didn't they? No, it no, it failed. Um, so why aren't they doing that? Uh, right now, there are a couple of senators working on it. Um, I don't think anything major is going to be done in the next year, in part, fundamental going to be done, because I think under the current rules, it would take 60 votes in the Senate, which is very difficult. There are a bipartisan group of senators, Patty Murray and uh, Lamar Alexander, working on something. Quite frankly, and I'm, I'm this disappointing, but I would be very surprised if there are fundamental changes in the next 12 months. I think it's going to have to wait till after the election, in my opinion. Yeah. Another one I have was about spending. Uh, that when the politicians get together, the first thing they have in their mouth is it's going to affect Social Security and Medicare. I never heard anyone, and I could be wrong on this, say that we got that special health care bill that the rest of the citizens don't have, and we've got that. Lifetime retirement that mm -hmm. other people don't get, not in that amount. And I don't see anything wrong with a lifetime retirement if it's within reason. A couple hundred thousand dollars a year should be great plenty, but this is way over the top. But you see on the internet, it's not true on either one of those. Um, yeah. Why do they spread that kind of crap then? Well, it gets out on the internet. I can tell you my health insurance. Um, it's what you'd call subsidized Obamacare. I mean, you tell me what you think of it. I think I've got it. A five thousand dollar deductible, and they they take something like five hundred and twenty bucks a month out of my paycheck for it. Um, as far as my retirement, I believe my retirement is the same retirement as all other federal employees. I get one percent of my salary times years worked, and you have to be there a minimum of five years to be vested. So if I leave after ten years, my pension would be like seventeen thousand a year, which you could say is too generous for working somewhere. It's too high for working someplace only 10 years, but it's not what they say is on the internet. I had one more. Um, on welfare reform, one of the things that I really, and I felt that was way out of hand with Obama, what about if they would, everybody, have to work at least a certain number of hours to get welfare? Uh, now, I see signs all over the place, help wanted, help wanted, help wanted. I think there are three things they ought to do, um, obvious things they ought to do if they take up welfare reform. I didn't talk about it. You're right, there should be some sort of work requirement. And when they do put work requirements, for example, on food stamps, the number of people who, who drop off is stunning. I think they ought to put time limits on there. We don't begrudge anybody that's going through a tough part of their life, but, but it's not supposed to be a lifestyle. You know, It's not supposed to be a 10-year thing. And uh, I think drug testing may be needed. Because right now, a lot of businesses out there, they do drug testing. And again and again, they say you can't work for us because you can't pass the drug test. Well, if you're not able to get a job because you can't pass the drug test, why in the world is the government giving you something? So I, I think those are three things that should be done. All right, we have time for a couple more. Steve Ahern. Yeah, I, uh, I wanted you to speak out against Ron Johnson, but obviously you bought into the 
secret society based on your other statements. So let me ask. I don't know what Ron Johnson said on that topic. <laughs> well, I think you would. <laughs> okay. You, you lament earlier about how each citizen has the sixty thousand dollar. Yeah, you voted for the tax bill, which added one point five trillion to that bill. How do you rectify those statements? Um, in order to balance the budget, we need a booming economy. <coughs> it is hard to imagine having a booming economy when your corporate income tax rate is so much higher than the rest of the industrialized world. Okay, I mean, it's just that simple. Um, if you have a, a relatively minor increase in the rate of growth of the American economy, it is going to more than pay for the tax cut. And I realize we're going to have to go through, we're going to have to see how much of an effect it has. Um, I think you see already um, the big increase in the stock market. I would be surprised if there's not a big increase in income tax payments on capital gains, taxes, and the tax returns that are filed on April 15th. So I think you're already <laughs> going to see an increase in tax receipts. I would assume that's one of the reasons why there's a bigger surplus for the state of Wisconsin. And the whole purpose of the tax cuts was not just to give people money back, it was to grow the economy. And if we're going to go back to maybe someday 3 or 4% growth in this economy, it's going to do a lot towards reducing that deficit. All right, Joe Mahler. Joe? Joe? Is it my turn? Maybe. It could be you, Joe. Well, I got for him. I'm his representative. He wants me to talk for him. He's gone. Go ahead, Tom. All right, Barbara Van Clive, Van Clash. Oh, I'm the city clerk here for the state of Wisconsin. I wasn't aware of if you were aware of the Wisconsin Senate vote the other day to not confirm the appointments of our election commission and and our uh, ethics commission administrators. I don't know those folks. Um, I, I actually Googled it, and I think I met with Haas at some time or other, but I don't even remember what the meeting was about. I have an opinion one way or the other. And uh, the other portion of my question is, we keep talking about the immigration problem here, but wouldn't you think if we would put more punishment on the people that are actually employing these people, Illegally. Uh, I, think was, I think a little more e verified. Instead of fines, yeah. fines do nothing to big companies, especially the ones that are constantly hiring illegals and you read about them getting busted, doing this again. And, and why not actually do something with these people? It's a criminal, it should be a criminal offense, not just a slap uh, on the back and fine. I think you're going to see a, a step up e verify eventually. <coughs> off their money, they don't want to come yeah. here. All right, and that's what we have time for this morning. But oh, I didn't do one more. Should do one more? We're really short on time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well. Tom Walt Wagner? Yes, that's me. Okay. Ooh. Yes, I have a question. I have a neighbor. He's a young man, doesn't work. And I asked him why he don't have to work. He said, well, what did he say? Uh, well, he had a nervous breakdown. So now he sits um, at that side problem exercise, some kind of income, because he had a nervous breakdown. And I know, no, he said he had a nervous breakdown. Is he going to be on that uh, all his life? I, I think they're going to be looking at the disability, too. And that's, by the way. Uh, uh, a nervous breakdown, well, so when he gets on exercise, he had a nervous breakdown. Don't you try to put him in a program, help him out? We just uh, uh, put them to the side and let them sit there and they don't question his ability. Um, I, I think when we look at things, they are going to look at, at the disability. I think everybody knows people who are on disability who should not be on disability. Okay, now I, I can see that we got to get out of here and on to the next stop. So thanks for being here.